Well, welcome and good evening. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and we have an extremely honorable uh, speaker and famous speaker worldwide today, um, Professor Terry Eagleton. I'll introduce him in a moment. Um, but before, before that, I would like to um, say several sentences about these uh, new lab debates um, that DEMOS, Institute of Critical Thought, and Lithuanian New Left um, are organizing every, um, every month, sometimes every fortnight. Um, and this year, um, there will be monthly debates um, uh, in the future, uh, this season, um, and we'll invite also renowned speakers to come and, and speak. Um, um, I would like to thank uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation uh, for cooperation and support. Um, without, without their generous support, um, uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in, in Warsaw support, we wouldn't be able to organize these events. Um, and I especially thank Joanna Gwazdecka and Piotr Janiszewski, uh, who are here, actually, for, for supporting this wonderful event. Um, well, <coughs> Professor Terry Eagleton is a literary critic, universally regarded as one of the most influential literary theorists in the English-speaking world today. He has published widely in literary criticism, in social theory, in, in, in theology, on the critique of ideology, on Marxism, and in other fields and on other numerous topics. Over the past 40 or so years, Terry Eagleton has published 50, more than 50 books, both top academic uh, academic publishers. Um, several of his recent books include The Meaning of Life, Why Marx Was Right, Reason, Faith and Revolution on Evil, the event of literature just published this year. Terry Eagleton has held various academic posts in Britain, Ireland and in the USA. He was a professor at the University of Oxford for a number of years, uh, nearly 30 years, uh, I believe. Uh, uh, he was a chair of English at the University of Manchester. At the <coughs> University of Edinburgh, he delivered the prestigious Gifford lecture entitled The God Debate. Currently, Professor Eagleton is the chair of the Department of English and Creative Writing at Lancaster University a visiting professor at the University of Notre Dame in the USA, and a fellow of British Academy. Educated at Cambridge, Terry Eagleton has a working class slash Catholic background. His thought is uh, firmly rooted in Marxism. He was active in revolutionary Marxist uh, organizations, the International Socialists, and Workers' Socialist League in the past. Terry Eagleton also writes political commentary for publications such as The New Statement, Red Pepper, and The Guardian. Terry's talk today is entitled The Second Coming. Dear comrades, <laughs> friends, colleagues, please welcome Terry Eagleton. news is that if there's a fire, I can get out. <laughs> well, I'm very gratified that you should all come. So many of you should come tonight. You know, Mick Jagger couldn't attract a crowd like this before. <laughs> no comparison. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. My first visit to Vilnius and to Lithuania. I'm, I must say I'm not actually very well. I, I'm recovering from uh, about a flu, like many people. So if I dramatically fall over in the middle of this talk. Just try to work out what I might have said. <laughs> I might even have a kind of competition at the end, you know, the most accurate account of what I 
might have said. Um, I, did, um, I did, as Andreas mentioned, I did last year publish a remarkably cheap and extraordinarily attractive book called um, Why Marx Was Right. I, I read a little to myself each night, <laughs> marveling at the eloquence of its language, the incisiveness of its insights, the appropriateness of its imagery. You too can share this ecstatic experience. Oh, uh, sir? The price of the book. Oh, well, we won't go into these material, material, <laughs> materialist details. Uh, you, you can share this ecstatic experience um, by buying a copy. You will, you will, if you buy a copy, you will receive the author's signature. You buy two copies, you might get a kiss. <laughs> I prefer to buy one copy in that case. I don't know some of you. Anyway, I, um, two, um, two strange things will happen when this book first came out. One is, I got a letter from an enthusiastic man in the outback of Australia, who I didn't know, saying, uh, why didn't you call the book Why Marx Is Right? <laughs> so I wrote him a letter back saying, um, actually, um, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time for news to travel to <laughs> a century or so. You know? and, uh, and the second extraordinary thing that happened, but I'm trying desperately to find my notes here, was that for a a giddy few weeks, uh, the book was actually um, among the best sellers among the Amazon business books. <laughs> what on earth was happening there? You know, I mean, when, uh, when chief executive officers have to start reading me, then uh, the system really is, really is in some kind of trouble. And I was thinking about why, why, that, why well, that was the case. I mean, why, why suddenly did, um, I just looking for the first page of my notes, which seems to have disappeared, but there we are. I just have to make it up. Why suddenly were, a few years ago, were capitalists talking about capitalism? The reason, of course, that they read my book was not because they wanted to know about Marxism. They wanted to know about capitalism, yes, because they were in big trouble. And there was a sense in which they were now talking and thinking about capitalism for the first time. Yes, I mean, capitalists don't go around talking about capitalism any more than, you know, people go around calling themselves fatso or, you know, <laughs> yes? I mean, you can go around talking about, you know, market society or liberal democracy and so on. That's fine. But when, um, when people start, when the, when the ruling class itself begins to see itself as a system, then that, of course, is a sign that all is not well. You know, there is uh, something deeply awry about the situation. And that's really what's been happening, I suppose, um, that um, it isn't really very good for capitalism to think of itself as a system. Um, better for it to be, as it were, the invisible colour of everyday life itself, you know, too close to the eyeball to be objective. <coughs> because, of course, uh, to see yourself as a system is to see yourself as having limits, it's to see the possibility of other systems. It's also to see that a system has a history and whatever was born can always die. Yes? So it's not the best way of thinking about it. Um, but what happened, of course, is that with, with the, the crisis of the system, is that suddenly the system had to, it assumed a new kind of visibility. It was perceptible precisely as a system in a new kind of way. Um, and that itself is a sign of crisis. And I think one of the interesting points about that is that what then happened was very much what Marx was doing. Because one of Marx's achievements, I think, was to make the capitalist mode of production perceptible as a specific, historical, fairly <coughs> recent, non-eternal system, powered by its own peculiar laws, driven by its own kind of necessities. And as soon as you distance and frame and objectify, and as it were, estrange a system in that way, then you break a certain sense of its naturalness. You denaturalize it. And I think that was one of Marx's major <coughs> achievements. It was one of his major points of originality. Um, a lot of Marx's work, of course, isn't particularly original. A lot of the concepts central to Marx 
I'm not particularly original. It is not intended as a criticism. I mean, originality.